Today, we're going to talk about the difference between insulators and conductors. Insulators versus conductors, two extreme types of materials. The whole issue here has to do with the question of what happens if we have an electric field and we take some typically solid material, here's a solid material in the shape of a potato, and we ask the question, what happens to the electric charges that are embedded within that solid material? How do they respond? Typical material will be have both positive and negative charges in it. And we want to know how do the charges respond to an applied electric field. And there's two extremes that we want to look at today. So the first extreme corresponds to the concept of an ideal insulator. And the idea of a neon insulator has a simple rule, and that is that the charges, if there are any, stay put. They don't move. They don't go anywhere. If they're there, they stay put. So for example, if you have a sphere of some radius, and you put some uniform positive charge spread out throughout that sphere, a uniformly charged sphere, with some arbitrary charge density rho, uh, so if the sphere has a radius of r, big R, then uh, the charge density is rho naught or some constant for r less than r, and it's zero for r greater than r. So in this example, those charges are in that sphere and they stay put. Another example is a uniform surface charge, say on a sphere or whatever. In this case, the charge that's put on the surface stays on the surface, has some constant charge density, whatever it is. For an insulator, if the object is put into an electric field, then whatever charges are on the insulator stay put. They don't respond to the electric field. They're stuck where they are. The electric field just penetrates the object, and the net electric field you get is the superposition of the two together. In contrast, an ideal conductor corresponds to a material where all the charges are free to move, and they will move immediately, instantly, in response to any applied electric field. And the immediate consequence of this idea is that the electric field in a conducting material is always zero. It's always zero, and furthermore, the charge density inside the material itself is always zero. Now, how does this work? Well, if you imagine, it's an argument against uh, contrary. The electric field it was applied, any charges would move, and they'd keep moving until that electric field was canceled out. If there was any residual field, the charges would keep moving. But they always, always move quickly to cancel out the electric field. It doesn't matter what the shape of the uh, conductor is, the net charge inside the material is zero. You can have a potato, you can have a circle, you can have a conducting wire. For that whole wire, the length of the wire inside the material, the electric field is zero, and the charge density inside the wire is zero. So let's think about what happens uh, with an ideal conductor um, in the context of the electric fields that are outside. Now, an electric field could be outside a conductor. That's allowed. And here I've shown an electric field coming into the surface at some angle so that it has two components, a perpendicular component and a parallel component. Now, if the parallel component is not zero, well, then the charge will move on the surface of the conductor until the parallel component is zero. So just like the total field inside the conductor is zero, the field at the surface, the field lines coming into the surface must connect parallel to the surface, perpendicular to the surface, sorry, so that the parallel component is always zero. In other words, the electric field lines that are coming into a charge can only come in at a perpendicular angle to the surface. If we take, say, a neutral conductor and embed it in a uniform electric field, as is indicated by the brown lines here, then those field lines will be interrupted by the conductor. And furthermore, there will be no field inside the conductor, and the field lines themselves will have to intersect the conductor at right angles. In other words, they'll bend so that they come into the surface. Notice that in order for this to happen, the field lines have to end. There must be something called an induced surface charge, negative and positive, that appears on the surface so as to cancel out the interior field. So if we consider an ideal conductor with some field lines coming in, 
the field lines enter the surface at a perpendicular angle, if I've drawn it right. The field lines are interrupted inside the conductor, but the surface of the conductor basically forms a surface that's perpendicular to the field lines everywhere. As we know, any surface that is perpendicular to the electric field lines is called an equipotential, which is to say that the voltage on any conducting surface is the same everywhere over the entire surface. So for example, if I have a piece of conducting wire, and I apply a voltage V0 at one end of the wire, uh, there will automatically must appear a voltage V0 at the other end. Wire transports voltage. That's what wires do. They transport voltage from one place to another. So here we have a couple of some examples of con ideal conductors. Uh, choice B is an ideal conductor with a positive surface charge, all the field lines going out. Choice C is the uh, same conductor but now embedded in a uniform field where all the field lines enter and exit at a perpendicular. So in summary then, uh, for an ideal conductor, uh, no, sorry, an ideal insulator, the charge stays put. The charge doesn't move. And you use superstition to figure out what the electric fields are. The insulator doesn't by itself deflect or change the electric fields. In contrast, in an ideal conductor, the electric field and the charge density inside will be zero. The charges will move instantaneously to cancel any field. The electric field is perpendicular to the surface. In order for that to happen, charges have to be induced on the surface by external fields, and the surface corresponds to an equipotential, which is to say the voltage is constant on the surface. You might wonder why we call an insulator uh, insulator. The idea is that no current can flow since the charges stay put. In contrast, uh, charges of an ideal conductor, the charges can flow, and therefore a conducting material can uh, conduct current. In other words, the words insulator and conductor are words that apply to the prospect of current moving charges, that is to say, moving through the material. An insulator has no moving charges and therefore no current can flow. For an in a conductor, the charges are free to move, and so a material that is made out of conductor is a material through which current can flow. This is quite different from how these objects are defined, however. Remember, the electric field is what defines, and the response to the electric field is what defines a current a conductor and an insulator. For an insulator, no matter what the electric field is, the charges stay put. For a conductor, the charges move instantaneously, at least in the ideal case, so as to cancel the electric field and that there's no electric field inside. So in some sense the word the insulator has no effect on the electric field whereas the conductor has a serious effect basically canceling it out.